Welcome to the 23rd episode of the Influential Wellnesspreneur podcast. My name is Sebastian Hilbert and I'm the wellnesspreneur expert. I have wellness business owners and therapists who don't have systems in place to grow their business and market themselves and leverage their business to put in structures into their business so they can actually gain more clients and leads, uh, a consistent lead flow. And on that journey, I meet some really great people and um, I decided to interview them on a VT basis so I can share their story and their maybe also their mistakes with you so you can learn from them and grow your wellness business. Now today I have Greg DeSchulze. Do you actually, I actually have to ask him, um, do, how do you pronounce it correctly, Greg? Um, quick hello, how do you pronounce it the last thing correctly? I didn't ask you that beforehand. Uh, Craig Schulz. Craig Schulz, it's, it's very German, isn't it? Very much. <laughs> really good. Um, I actually have a good friend in Germany who um, is uh, uh, also called Schulz, um, but it's written with an E in the, at the end, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, very good. So very good to know, guys. If you want to look up Greg um, and you um, uh, type into Google, um, Greg, Greg Schulz with an E at the end. <laughs> Okay, so to everyone who's out there, let me quickly introduce you, Craig Schultz, to you. He lives in Melbourne and he's been in business for over 20 years. And he started as a corporate engineer, but quickly after two years, moved into industry um, following his passion, which was to work in the fitness industry. A 12 year career in the industry, he was a multi award winning trainer who owned five gyms, helped franchise the business and trained over 10,000 people. Now that's a big number. And that's what I want to talk about when, uh, mostly actually today um, for all the fitness trainers out there to see how he's done that and what were the bumps in the road. From 2006 and the back on the, of, end of growth in the internet, smartphone technology and social media, he transitioned from traditional business to home business where he has pioneered youth enhancement products into over 100 country. Second part, I'm very interested in what's going on there and how he's done that. So let's go right into the two questions. Greg, where does it all start? You started as an engineer. I mean, seriously, what's, what's going on here? Like, how did it start and, and, and what was the progress there? <laughs> Thanks, Sebastian. I'm really looking forward to uh, sharing some insights to your audience today. I, I do have a lot of experience across a lot of different industries working from a corporate engineer to traditional business to home business and more of an e-commerce internet-based business. So looking forward to uh, chatting to your audience. But I guess I grew up in the small island of Tasmania, which is at the bottom end of the coast in Australia. And I guess when I look at my journey to date, I grew up in a small family in a small mining town and I left home when I was 15 years of age to pursue education to get ahead in life and I always felt that I had that entrepreneurial spirit which was always about I never liked trading time for money yeah so when, even when I was 14 15 years of age I was working out ways to uh, make money without having to invest you know that trading time aspect so I was always an entrepreneur then I become an engineer, so I did follow that, you know, your parents advise you to get a good education and a good job. So I spent five years at university to become an engineer and two years into that career, I just, I, I didn't really enjoy what I was, I actually enjoyed what I was doing, but I felt I wasn't really aligned to a 40-year a career as an engineer and I started um, looking to follow my passions at a very early age and and my passion was fitness and health and fitness and i love being with people i loved helping people so I, I i packed up my bags and become a personal trainer and and that led me into being uh starting a gym when i was 21 years of age so wow so where where do you think that and uh, it came from that that following your passion but also that the, the fitness passion itself um i think really everything gets down to um, your open-mindedness. And for me, you know, everyone gets trapped into a, you know, a school of thought and follows, you know, a pathway. And I always say to people, keep an open mind to everything um, because everything and anything's possible. If someone's done it before, it can be done again. Um, so, and when I talk about open-minded, I don't say just keep an open mind and go and do anything. You need to put, good due diligence practices in place 
to that idea or that concept and make sure you do follow through and do good research and due diligence. And most importantly for me, it's about uh, speaking to highly credible people on decisions. If I invest into property, I always run my idea by who I would call my confidence in, you know, that have already got what I want. They're mentors effectively, and I run my ideas past them. So keep an open mind and, um, and uh, I guess make sure that you do the right due diligence processes before you go and fall on your face um, and make the mistakes. Yeah, so that's what you did with, you, you reckon, um, with the fitness, um, with, the, with the different fitness gyms on that journey. So when you were there, you, you think you did that correctly there or were you still very much learning? I guess for me, I had zero business experience. I was 21. I just purchased a gym, zero business experience. But I, what I did know is my passion was, you know, um, I guess working with people. I, I played a number of sports at, at state league, you know, very competitive level. So I was really passionate about that industry, um, but I didn't know anything about business. But also, I was making a huge career choice. I spent five years at university and only worked in my profession for two years so I didn't want to just be that everyday personal trainer in a park I wanted to control my destiny so I actually um, you know wanted to be in business for myself that there was a huge risk at that age it could have turned out really badly but once I made that decision I put myself into that corner and I actually just learned business I actually found mentors I actually every night I'd go home and read books on how to um, find clients, read books on sales and marketing. So what were, what were some, some first books you, you read? One of the first books, one of my first mentors, he was a really, really successful business person. And 20 years on, we're still great friends today. And again, I, he's someone that I run all my ideas past. He talked about the importance of building relationships with people will carry you in a long direction and he recommended how to win friends and influence people. So that was one of the very, very first books I read because as a personal trainer, building relationships with your customers is absolutely everything. So that was one of the first books I read. Rich Dad, Poor Dad was one of the first books I read, which really um, took, that, that's where probably open-mindedness to be in your own business. I was really, you know, I'd be terrible now if I had to be employed by someone because I've got a creative mind, I'm hard working, I'm go-getting, but I like working my own hours. So now I'm teaching people about creating lifestyle by design so you can control your own future. But those two books there were pretty pivotal early on in my uh, early days in business. But, you know, the, I read hundreds of books over the journey. Yeah. The point for the personal trainers out there, the tipping point, was a really important book for me. I learned a really powerful referral strategy of um, reading the book, The Tipping Point. Um, so that was also quite a powerful book. And then moving forward into my journey, The Next Millionaire by Professor Paul Zane Pilsner opened my mind to business growth trends. And that was probably five years into the journey. Oh, There's more yeah. So you, you, I remember you saying, um, you, so you built, um, basically you started um, what, at one gym and then it became two, three. What happened during your journey? Like um, that, what happened there? What, what, are some, what do you think was one of the, the most challenging um, experience you had during the time? I guess um, my, I, I mastered the art of one gym and we get back to trading time for money. Um, in my third year, I was in my early 20s, I was making great money and I was starting to choose my own hours, but I felt to myself always that there was a cap on what I could earn in that gym. My vision was to earn a lot more than that. And I thought, if I've mastered the art of this gym, why don't I keep duplicating what I've done? And um, an opportunity opened up where I expanded my business into another state. Um, so I was living in Adelaide at the time and I expanded into Melbourne um, and I set up four more gyms that I own myself, but I helped a company franchise their business and was involved in setting up around 20 
odd different franchises. But I guess it gets back to um, vision for my what I wanted to earn and getting back to creating lifestyle by design. That led me with my entrepreneurial spirit to take a risk. And that probably led to my probably my biggest challenge in that um, on that journey too is I did get ahead of myself. So only one human comfortableness was quite good. I stretched myself in every different capacity. I grew too fast. Um, I, I, I do mention I got ahead of myself. And at one point in time there, I was opening gyms. Um, I was franchise. I, I was working like 12, 15 hours a day to get to where I wanted to, to go. And the GFC come in and the bank stopped lending money to people. So it was hard to sell gyms to people. And for my fit outs for gyms, it was hard to get finance for that. And that put me in a really, really awkward situation about six years into my fitness um, career. Um, and that was probably at the time where I realized then that I wanted to transition out of owning gyms. So I spent the next six years uh, exiting that uh, business model. Right, interesting. So you said you, you, you got ahead of yourself. So um, what, was, what was that like? Um, I guess when I'm in my early 20s, everything I touched in that thing in terms of business, I started investing in property, everything was just turning to gold and I thought that I just knew everything. Mm. And you know, I was 25 <laughs> years of age and I thought, oh, I'm going to buy more gyms. And I just kept on, you know, I probably should have, established another gym before moving into the next one and yeah um, i i did really go hard and i and i'm a big risk taker and i was living on the edge of finance so one more bad decision and one of those decisions come when i was proposing to my wife in the greek islands it was the first time that i really stepped out of the business for eight weeks and I'd made a bad staffing decision. And over that eight week period, one of my gyms lost over half their membership and was running at a significant loss. So, you know, I, um, I uh, you know, it, it sort of all just caught up with me quite quickly. Wow, so what do you do now to avoid, uh, to avoid that? Um, again, it does get back to, you know, uh, I read a book last year, or it was actually, I listened to an audio book. I consume audio way better than reading, and I want to consume information quickly. So I do listen to audio books more so than read. But I was listening to an audio book last year from Ray Dalio called Principles. And he, he really hammered home the um, using those mentors for advice, listening to highly credible people. Not your mates, not your family that haven't achieved any, you know, what you want. Highly credible people in that space. People that have already walked the journey. So for me, um, I protect myself quite well now by speaking up. I'm investing in property, so I'm looking at some new property deals at the moment. You know, I run it by the people that have already, who I respect in that industry. I run my ideas by them. If it's a business decision, um, you know, whatever it is, I really do look to um, go through all the pros and cons with people that I respect um, their feedback on. And would you, very good. No, I, I totally agree with you. I think um, that's one of my um, biggest lessons in my, you know, short period of, of business. So for me, it's just really, well, I've been doing my own thing for five years, but really we've just focusing on doing seriously maybe for one and a half years before we're just traveling around Europe. So <laughs> doing something on the more the side hustle. So, but one, one thing I totally agree with you is um, having a mentor that has been there, done that is, and that, that's very crucial. Yes. Has been there, done that is, is, is very important and, and extremely helpful. Um, absolutely. So, where did you go from, from, from there? I know that like, what was the new journey after you, you changed? Where did you go from there? I guess for me, I always look at trends. You know, if you listen to Gary V um, podcasts and audios, if, 
you know, you're really into his stuff. He does talk a lot about trends and he can predict the future with what's happening, you know, in social media and trends, et cetera, et cetera. So I've always been that type of person as well. And I identified back in around 2006, A, I was going through a challenging business time where I just, I mentioned that where I had a staffing issue, I grew too fast, you know, I'd lent too much off the bank, et cetera, et cetera. I was at that real crossroad period. And at the time I was also, um, I lost a little bit of passion for what I was doing at the time as well. I got to start to get towards my late twenties and I started to go, Hey, if I have a family, you know, if I settle down in life, it's not just me anymore. It's okay getting up at 10 to five in the morning, getting home at eight o'clock at night, but can I do this in 10 years time? So I started thinking forward. I started looking, I started attending seminars. I started really researching trends and at the time social media really started to emerge um so when i started my first gym there's no youtube there's no facebook there's no um the phone you use you could call and text people that was about it around 2006 you know five years six years into my journey into business everyone was starting to get onto social media. Everyone was starting to get their first smartphone. You know, everyone, you know, with, with tools like we're on Zoom now, but you know, really it was just nearly Skype back then, but everyone started using webinar platforms and so many tools on the internet. I started feeling owning a bricks and mortar traditional business was a very old school way to do business. So in, in my industry, the fitness industry, people, won't travel more than 10 kilometers to go to the gym or, or the or the masses so i felt owning a gym was limiting my ability so i started to think about how can i implement uh internet-based opportunities into my gym so when i say inter, inter, um, internet-based opportunities i wanted to be able to use these growing emerging trends, internet, social media, smartphone, into my gym. This is all the way back in 2006. So I originally started selling nutrition products, weight loss products, all sorts of different products to my clients because now the internet, social media allowed, it, allowed you to do it. I started being more innovative inside of my gym, but I still felt that I was limiting my opportunity because, you know, my gyms would have 200, 300, 400 members, um, and I knew the possibility to do something on a global scale was a lot more uh, possible. So I was just through research, looking at trends, and um, you know, I, I ended up moving into the direct selling industry, and I've been there for 12 years, at, um, 2006 to now, and. You know, I, I've built business now into 100 countries. I still have aligned myself to my passion, which is health, wellness, beauty, youth enhancement. And uh, that's probably where the journey moved from traditional business, transitioned out over six years while I did um, some stuff from home. But now I just travel around the world, um, you know, and, and I do have what I call a lifestyle by design. Yeah. And you, yeah, last up I was sign and um, you really made that step happen to move away from, as you said, you know, 10 kilometers. I, yesterday, I met um, a good friend of mine who also was on the podcast. Um, his name is Dave Nixon and he has a gym at the moment. And he recently just scaled back to really get that one gym right to really understand, you know, how that works properly. And he's really, really good at what he does. But I had to drive a half an hour to get to the gym. And I did a session as well to experience it. And, you know, I was like, okay, not sure if I would do this again. So as you said, the, the um, brick and mortar business really re restrains you and how about your reach. So I um, totally agree. And I see um, since you've been in the um, diet sales industry now for 12 years and you're traveling around the world, um, you, you made that step and uh, successfully. And I'm sure you, you're having lots of fun with it as w what I see out there. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And look, it's not for everybody either. The guys that bought my gyms off me, they do like that. They're old fashioned and they do like seeing something physical and tangible. And, you know, that, that, that they're doing really well in that, those businesses as well. But for me, 
being able to work from home, being able to have flexibility, being able to travel, being able to literally do business anywhere in your world, the world you want, as long as you can access your phone, the internet, social media, that's what aligns with me and that's what appeals to me. But it's not for everybody. So I'm not saying it's the only way. It's the mm. way I'm supposed to do business and you know, I'm really happy with the decision. Yeah, amazing. And how, how does it work? Um, how does it feel right now? I know you have a um, beautiful little uh, addition to your family um, since, uh, what was it, four months? Four months. So, so how's that with that? For me, um, my I've been in the last seven years to probably 60 different cities in the world. I took my first boy to Dubai when he was 12 weeks of age. By the time he was six months of age, he toured through England, Italy, um, Turkey. Uh, last year, at two, two and a half, or at 18 months, he went to Switzerland, England, Italy. You know, so he's three years of age and he's been probably further and traveled more than my entire you know, family tree. Uh, my little daughter's only four months of age and she's already been to Canada, Hawaii. So, you know, I guess, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to, um, yeah, allowing them to uh, experience the world. I get to spend time at home with them whenever I want to. I travel. I'm off to India tomorrow. Um, but uh, I was in Scotland Island last week and Canada, Hawaii the week before. So, um I love what I do. I'm passionate about what I do. My wife's actually extended families from the UK, so I often go over there for weeks, weeks on end and just live there as if we're living there as well. So as I said, that's for me. It's not for everybody, but um, you know, I love being able to have flexibility, being able to spend time with family. I love um, being able to experience what the world has to offer too because I often say to people, you're only here once, experience it as much of it as you can. Yeah, absolutely, totally agree with it. And congratulations um, for me being being a role model on that because that's what I would aspire to as well. It's uh, it's a beautiful thing to have um, because, as you said, the world is uh, is big and there's lots to experience. I just recently and gave my partner Teresa a thing called a scratch map. You know, you, you put it up and um, and you can scratch out the countries that where you've been to, and um, and they come up in different cultures, see where you are. And uh, we love traveling. We've been traveling around Europe and, we, and she recently put this up and scratched out the countries where we were. And then she gave me a call. It's like, oh my God, we've been nowhere. <laughs> yeah, I've got a pin board in my office with all, and every time I go to a new country, cool. yeah, I put a pin on the pin board. So, yeah. Yeah, cool thing to share. I'd love to see that. That should have a, quite a few pins on there, nicely spread out. <laughs> uh, nicely spread out. I've been from Africa. Uh, the only place I haven't really been is deep into South America. Mexico is as close as what I'd call South America, but mm. Europe probably five or six times, the US you know, a dozen times, into Asia every 90 days. So I uh, certainly experience the world. India. Very nice. Very nice. Yeah, very, 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 very cool. Um, the other questions are a question I wanted to ask you. Um, you know, you say your passion is still there and that's that what still gets, gets you going. So has it changed over the years or has that always been kind of a, a red threat with you? Um, I always say to people, get passionate about what you're doing all the time. Whether you're in a job, um, you know, you need to have passion with what you're doing or, or, or you sort of, I guess, the fire inside you burns out and you know, I, I say don't get into a situation where you go through those groundhog day moments where you just you know you're getting up and you hate Mondays and you're using words like hump day and you can't wait for Friday because you're wishing your life away so what I try and do with people when they come to me for mentoring for coaching etc you know we really look at a, a good five-year plan so work on five-year plans it might be savings you know a savings process a debt reduction process investment process you know it's you got to work on moving forward one step at a time day after day after day after day but for me right now i probably could kick back and do nothing 
play golf or whatever I want to choose. But I'm passionate about what I do. I love what I do. I work hard still. You know, as I said, I'm just about to tour India, which is not for me one of my favourite places in the world to go. But I'll be running seminars where I get 500 plus people to each seminar, and I want to empower people, inspire people. And I, you know, beyond what I'm doing now in my business, I have legacy projects built um, in place that I really want to dedicate time to and one of those and you, you mentioned about challenges in on your journey my wife and I lost a baby just before birth and um, I was in a really a crossroad phase of my business at the time because you know I was doing well but not incredibly well and you know a lot of people would have packed their bags up and you know had a mindset that the world's against me and so on. Whereas I use that for me as inspiration to move forward. And we've now got two beautiful kids beyond that. Um, but at that point in time, it's uh, when people ask me about it, I'm very, very comfortable talking about it, but it was, it literally was like having an out of body experience at the time. It's just like your world just hit. Um, but moving forward, you know, inspiration for me is to give back into that sort of area. And I've got some ideas for books, um, you know, donations towards charities that are, you know, are in that space as well. So, you know, having something to work towards can drive passion. So, you know, if you are sitting there listening to this, find out what you're passionate about and have something to work towards and, and break everything up in five year plans. People lack patience for success. Success takes time. You know, you hear all the top entrepreneurs talk about the 10,000 hours, the 10,000 hours in the field to become that expert, to dominate an area. Um, it doesn't matter if you're in a job or you've got a business or you're, you know, whatever it is, uh, there's ways to leverage your time and money. Um, whether it's investments in shares or whether it's investments in property, whether it's um, starting your own business or doing a direct selling company like I do, um, you know, a five year good solid plan is, you know, is something that can really start leveraging your time and money. I actually even did an audio book on my 20 year career in business and, it's, uh, and the audio book is called uh, create leverage and become unstoppable. So, you know, I talk about, you know, all the ways to create leverage in your life, time, money, and meaningful relationships. Wonderful. Wonderful. Something I definitely have to have to look up. I ring some bells, but I haven't downloaded it yet. So I definitely um, have to have a look at that. And I recommend everyone to do so as well. I mean, after this story, I'm sure everyone who's listening uh, wants to have a look at that one. <laughs> very, very good. Um, so just, because I know that there's probably quite a, a, a few people in my network in the audience who would like to, who may be um, probably a fitness trainer or on the fitness industry. And also because um, I met Dave yesterday who um, builds his fitness business. Can we just, um, to wrap up, uh, what are the, like, the three key factors to establish really well-running gym? Well, I guess for everything, when you run, you need to really have a really good marketing strategy. So that's, that there's a really, like if you're running a gym, except people are gonna drop out. Just accept that that's just, people quit school, people quit marriage, people quit sport, people quit everything, people will quit your gym membership. So you need to make sure that you're bringing more people through the door than are going out the back end. That's a really key point. So have a really well-built marketing strategy and the strongest part of that, I believe, is a referral marketing strategy. All right, so referral. So if you're running a good gym, that's a good product, good service, you know, people love coming to there. You've got, you know, your one year, your two year, your three year, your four year clients. You know that you've got something rock solid and stable. You, you know, you know you've got something that people will refer based on. Um, you go back to that book I referred to, The Tipping Point. One of the referral strategies I learned there was really about questions to ask people to find out if they're good referrals. 
So if someone new came into my gym, I would always ask them, you know, do they live locally? Yes, most people live locally. I say, do you have a favorite cafe? Yes, I do. And then they'll, they'll start telling you the menu, they'll start telling you the barista, they'll start telling you, so do you have a favorite hairdresser? Yes, I do. And go to Bromwyn, she's, she's incredible. Like, if a person elaborates on the question in depth, you know that they will be a good referrer for your brand. Right. All right. This is a referral strategy that I absolutely nailed in the induction process of the gym. Every person that was doing a free trial, I would identify straight away if they were going to be good referrers. All right. So that, that would be one thing. Uh, uh, and secondly, I guess really making sure that you've got rock solid systems in place. So systems built for finance, HR, um, that's where I made probably my biggest mistake in business. I uh, had incredible run of staff, staff that had stayed with me for six years, eight years. In fact, two of my managers bought my gyms. I had a really good run. When I was about to go away for eight weeks to spend time with my wife, uh, or my wife now, I was proposing in that eight weeks in the Greek islands, one of my really key staff members left a month before and I panicked and employed someone based on their resume and I knew I made a bad mistake and that cost me half my gym membership. So I used to, um, one of my key, I never ever before that had ever recruited or employed someone based on resume. I, uh, gyms is a personal business. So I wanted to know the person. I wanted to get to know their personality. I wanted to see if they had the ability to establish rapport. I couldn't care less if they knew 15,000 exercises or they, whatever, whatever. Um, it was really that, do they have a person ability to develop rapport with people? Um, so I would say uh, you can wreck your business by employing bad people, but make sure you've got a good system in there. And make sure all your systems are, you know, really, really good. The third thing I would say is look at ways to increase cash on clients. So when I say that, so you have a client that will come to you and business people will say, how do you widgetize your business? So turning one client into multiple sales. So your clients are coming to you for health benefits, for weight loss benefits, for fitness benefits, for strength benefits, whatever they're coming to you for. If you're providing good value for service, they may be interested in other services or products that you may have. So make sure you're the person that's delivering to them what they want because they'll go and buy it from somewhere else. So, you know, your client may be paying, be worth a hundred dollars a month to you. There's no reason that that couldn't turn into $200 a month to you. So making sure you're implementing programs might be like a 90 day, um, you know, uh, body transformation challenge, or it might be, um, you know, some products in nutrition, weight loss, whatever it is, find ways to widgetize your business to your clients, not uh, just the personal training or just the gym memberships. They can be multiple things. So that'd be the three key areas that I could say that, you know, if you do them, you're probably going to be working towards a profitable business. Love it. Absolutely love it. I have one question to these um, three, three key principles or factors. Um, and that's to the first one. So once you, uh, we love the first one, especially uh, the other ones, great, totally understand them, definitely would work, but I really love the first one. Once you've identified a good referrer, how do you utilize on them? Oh, I let, straight away, I'll let them know that, you know, if you wanted to bring two um, new people, into the gym you know, straight away, I'll give them a free gift of some sort. It may be their first month in the membership, I'll, I'll waive, you know, I'll incentivize them because really what am I giving away, whether it's a free PT session, whether it's um, uh, a free month membership, because you know, you're increasing 
the overall value of your sale by them bringing in two people. So you either don't offer something and, um, yeah, you either don't offer something and you don't get two new members or you offer them, you know, the incentive to actually bring people in. Okay? Your friends can come in on a no obligation free trial as well and spend the time here. If you, if they decide to join, this is what, you know, what we reward our clients with. And it might be a free PT session. It might be a free um, next body transformation challenge. It might be a free boot camp. It might be um, whatever it is. It, it's something that it's not costing you money. You know, it's something that it's either time or you're doing it anyway. So if you've got 20 people doing a personal uh, body transformation challenge, you've got one extra person in there. But if I had a referrer, so I had a chiropractor in my gym, he referred every one of his clients to me. Off the record, I would be really, I, I sent them away for weekends away and, you know, they were like very appreciative of, you know, me just surprising them with, um, you know, really high valuable and cost at that point in time gifts. But then when I go, okay, this client this year um, through his referrals at a, 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 an average of $120 a month, he's referred 20 people to me. You know, that, that client there is worth $2,000, $3,000 a month to me. So what's me spending $1,000 on a weekend away to reward this amazing person that's referred all those people? So if you can give something away for time, definitely let them know. If you've identified the referrer, you need to let them know. Don't let them read it on a board or wait for the next newsletter to go out or whatever that is. Let them know. Say, hey, if you really like what you do and you know a couple of people, this is what we offer. Yeah, very good. I absolutely love that. And I think there's lots of ways, if you put your head to it, how what you can find within your business to incentivize that person. But I think this is, this is the point um, you need to understand. That once you identify it, just find ways of utilizing it. And what you then said, when it even comes to like really big referrers and you put the system in place to actually have big referrers like that, which is awesome. And it then comes down to actually understanding, okay, what's, what's actually the lifetime value of my customer? And what does, what do these referrals mean financially to me? And then I know, you know, yeah. sending them on the weekends or whatever we want to do is, is a no brainer. Yeah. And you don't advertise that, but that's just a, a Oh yeah, of course. Yeah showing gratitude and you know that it just what goes around comes around yeah absolutely well great that was uh, was uh, such great insight um is there anything else you'd like to to share with us um do you want to invite maybe some people to, to get in contact with you or or do you have something coming up you you want to want to let them let the audience know well people uh, uh, um if you want to put my you know my website down just my brand craigschultz.com where they can download that audio book create leverage and become unstoppable that's a free audio book where i do go in depth with how to create leverage in your life like my background's been in business but through smart business decisions i've got an incredible property portfolio share portfolio and it's all about um, not trading time for money it's all about creating leverage in life leverage in life in time money and most importantly meaningful relationships now i always say to people you will mirror and represent the five people you hang around so if you're hanging around five strugglers that are dragging you down find a new network of people that you you can still socialize with those people but if they are you know you, you still need that mastermind of go-getters people getting ahead people that you know can add value in your life um so the meaningful relationship you never know what doors can be opened by having a really good powerful network and i went through a transition over probably a 10-year period where i had to distinguish and um you know friends that i grew up with i'm still friends with now but from a business perspective who i hang around and spend a lot of time with the people that look at the glass half full not glass half empty um, so I'd really encourage you to make a decision today that you're going to, in five years' time, have rapid transformation. 
you know, and put a good plan in place, work towards that because anything and everything is possible with an open heart and an open mind. So we'll leave it at that. And yeah, you can contact me on www.craig, C-R-A-I-G, Schultz, S-C-H-U-L-Z-E.com. Uh, feel free to connect with me on social media. I'm an educator on social media as well. So Sebastian can put my link and details up there. But thanks for having me on, Sebastian. I really appreciated, um, you know, you in, invited me to come on and share a bit of insight. It's an industry I'm passionate about, health, beauty, uh, wellness, you know, helping people and uh, wish you all the best on the journey ahead. Awesome. Thank you so much, Greg. That was, uh, that was awesome. Um, I definitely felt your passion. Um, I loved your talk about patience uh, coming to success. And I love the advice you've given, you've given around um, and living to your full potential. So there we have it, the free piece of this podcast, passion, patience, and potential. Really, 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 really cool. So thank you so much. As, um, as you said, all your links will, uh, of break will be um, in the show notes. Um, download the ebook, strongly encourage. I will do so as well. And if you know a fitness trainer or someone who... And wants to just change their life and live a life by design, I would, would mean the world to me if you could share this podcast edit episode with that person. So we spread the word and really get this incredible value out that um, Greg shared today with us. And in this manner, I say cheers, as my German background says, and see you all next time. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. If you would like to find out more about what Craig does, head to www.craigschultz.com. The links for his website and social are in the show notes, so check them out. Don't forget to subscribe to the Influential Wellness Printer podcast so you don't miss an episode and get involved in our social community. We look forward to seeing you next week when we interview Matthew Patty, international speaker, spiritual mentor, and teacher. Until then, have fun.